Good evening, everyone. Hello, I am Mark Jordan with the Wolf River Conservancy. I'm the Director of Development. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program, Mid-South Birds with Dr. Michael Collins. Before I introduce Dr. Collins, I want to thank our presenting sponsors for the 2021 Summer Lecture Series. Our corporate sponsor is Buckman. Our foundation sponsors the Crawford Howard Family Foundation. We also want to thank our 2021 benefactors, Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, the Griffles Foundation, International Paper, and Ring Container Technologies for their ongoing support. All of our supporters, corporations, community organizations, individual donors, and volunteers are critically important in allowing us to deliver on our mission, the protection and enhancement of the Wolf River watershed as a sustainable natural resource. As always, gifts of any size are appreciated. Look for the donation link in the chat box. I also want to remind you that our Discover the Greenway event is just around the corner, beginning May 22nd. Discover the Greenway lets you hunt for designated selfie spots along the Greenway, support our mission, and compete for some great prizes with values as much as $500. Get signed up today. To sign up and explore the completed sections of the Wolf River Greenway, you can find details on our website at wolfriver.org forward slash discover. A few housekeeping details. We ask that you do not attempt to record this program with any device. Also, when you have questions for Dr. Collins during the program, please use the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Our education director, Kathy Justice, will monitor the Q&A box and present questions during and after the program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Collins, Associate Professor of Biology at Rhodes College, where he teaches ecology, ornithology, wildlife, hemosupporting parasites in birds. That's a mouthful. Dr. Collins has been at Rhodes since 2010. He holds a PhD from the University of Tennessee, an MS from Florida State University, and a BS from the University of Arizona. He is currently the state president for the Tennessee Ornithological Society. Please welcome Dr. Collins. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. I'd like to thank participants for joining and giving me the opportunity to share one of my passions uh, with you guys. I can go on endlessly talking about birds. I'll not do that. I'll try to keep my comments within reason today. Um, and I'd like to give a particular shout out to both Kathy uh, Justice and, and Matt Wine Miller for, for going ahead and um, giving me the invitation to speak with you guys today. I'm going ahead and, and, and sharing my screen now. Um, can somebody confirm that you're able to see my screen with the Mid-South Birds as a title? I, I think it should be, be working. Just, yes, okay, we're good. Thank you. All right, so what we'll start today is um, it's not going to be everything you need to know about birds, uh, but uh, I, I consider myself an ecologist first who happens to study birds. I'm passionate about birds. I'm an avid bird watcher. Uh, and so what we're going to do is, is talk about some characters of birds, look at some avian adaptations, then we'll talk a little bit about what is a bird. Um, and then we'll look at some of their adaptations such as migration. We'll look in particular at their mating systems where bird have, birds have just been a fantastic study system for understanding uh, the way that um, populations can go ahead and reproduce. And then we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about threats and conservation. And lastly, we'll discuss some bird identification, some of the birds that you're likely to see right around town in your backyard or at Overton Park, uh, or uh, what you'd likely see as you paddle, say, the Wolf River. Right. So let's go ahead and start with a, a, the first question. Matt, can you go ahead and load that up, please? All right, so what traits are unique to birds? Um, bills, feathers, a four-chambered heart, all of the above, or bills and feathers? Okay, this is pretty exciting seeing these results coming in in real time. All right, if you haven't yet voted, go ahead and get your, your vote cast here in the next 10 seconds or so before we close it up. And as we continue on, you'll have to go ahead and X this out yourself uh, to, uh, to go ahead and see the, the rest of the slide. So it looks like a, a lot of people chose E, birds and feathers is the, the, the most popular vote. Um, and uh, some had said all of the above and some had said feathers. 
Uh, and can you guys, can everybody see the results? Fail to share. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and look at this. The answer isn't quite as easy as you might think. Historically, the answer had been E, bills and feathers. But as we'll see here in a moment, uh, there could be some uh, added complications, some nuance that can uh, maybe make us rethink this a little bit. All right, so traditionally, these unique characters uh, were feathers and bills. And these feathers serve a variety of functions from uh, water insulation to thermoregulation, um, increasing aerodynamics for flight. Um, and as you can see up here in this bird of paradise in the upper right, uh, feathers sometimes are modified to produce sound or visual imagery to entice females to mate, or in some cases to um, perhaps act as a social signal to um, repel rival males. Uh, and bills as well uh, have a variety of, of, of shapes. Uh, and so you can go ahead and, and look at some of these bills here. This right here, for those of you who don't know, this is not a malformed bill. This is the bill for a species called a cross bill. And it actually has its bill that crosses over and it can cross that bill over to pry open the sheaths of a pine cone and then use its tongue to extract the seeds within. And you can see some other bills here, such as that of the golden eagle in the lower right, a heron in the upper right, and a duck, and of course, a, a cardinal. And as we go ahead and look at these bills, we can see a number of different things. And, and the first is, is that these bills are not like chopsticks. Bills are actually maneuverable. They can go ahead and bend, especially birds with longer bills can go ahead and, and use it in a much more flexible way to go ahead and extract, for example, invertebrates from a, from a sand beach or something like this. Uh, but what we can see as we look across uh, a variety of species is by looking at the bill alone, we can infer the diet. And so the, there's a very tight relationship here between the uh, morphology, the shape, the size of a bill, and what a bird actually consumes. And so birds that consume insects are largely going to have finer bills. Um, birds that uh, eat fruits and seeds, uh, parrots and uh, grosbeaks beaks and things like that are going to have a much thicker bill to allow them to crack through the husk of those seeds. Um, ne ne uh, nectar feeding birds are generally gonna have these long bills that actually match the corolla, uh, corolla of the, of the flower. Um, and then inverts and, and vertebrates of uh, uh, things like raptors, this peregrine falcon down here in the bottom right has that nice uh, bill adapted for shearing flesh off of, off of bones. And perhaps less known is that the feet of birds are also highly adapted. Uh, and you can think about some uh, different species here. You can see, you know, most uh, clearly the, the webbed footing of a, of a duck, for example. But you can contrast that, for example, with the, the toes of a coot, which are not webbed. But instead, each individual toe of a coot looks like it's been smashed with a hammer. So that toe is, is laterally compressed. And it also has a bit of a hinge right along the midline. And so what that coot can do is as it's in, uh, engaging in the backstroke to propel itself forward, it can flare that toe out as a paddle. And then almost as if you were uh, paddling, you can then uh, straighten it up and, and move it forward in the water without uh, encountering a bunch of resistance, in this case, by folding those toes up. And you can see other adaptations here. The eagle, of course, with its talons, the ptarmigan with its feathering all the way down to the, to the tip of its toes, the long toes of a heron to allow it to, to walk across at the edge of the water, uh, across vegetation and things without falling down into uh, the substrate. Right? And, and so we get this tight relationship between form and function uh, through natural selection. And you can go ahead and, and think about this as, as more successful individuals, individuals that are better able to survive and, and to more importantly reproduce are more likely to pass those genes on to the next generation. And so those traits, to the extent that they are genetically determined, are going to be more common in the next generation. And so after generation after generation of, of natural selection, weeding out individuals that have traits that aren't as well matched to that particular environment, what you end up with is a collection of individuals, a population of a particular species, that is well adapted to that particular environment. And we, we see that in all sorts of ways with physiology and all sorts of things, but we've already looked at it in terms of the bills and the feet. And we can see it also in, in wings and many other types of morphological characters as well as behaviors and, and physiology. Right? So if we go ahead and, and think about natural selection then and how natural selection might have uh, selected, allowed for the evolution of feathers to evolve. 
All right, so if you go ahead and look, for example, at this red-tailed hawk in the bottom left and the red-winged bat blackbird, let's go ahead and think about why or how did feathers evolve? And Matt, would you go ahead and put up the next question, please? All right, so why did feathers evolve? One, a, or pardon me, A, defense, B, for flight, C, for insulation, D, for social signaling. Go ahead and cast your vote. like a neck and neck rate race between flight and insulation here. All right, go ahead and get your votes in in the next 10 seconds or so. All right, okay, excellent. Okay, so insulation with 51%, just barely a majority of the vote, followed by flight at 48%, defense at 13, and social signaling at, at 27. All right, so the answer for this is, is, is a bit nuanced. Um, the, the incorrect answer is flight. Um, the other three answers can all be um, important roles here. And, and so the way we can think about a, a, a feather evolving over time is we know that these feathers originally evolved from a, a more reptilian-like scale, uh, and, and but a feather doesn't develop de novo. It doesn't come out of nothing. When we think about natural selection, we need to think about small incremental changes over time. So the first feather wasn't likely to be a large primary feather that would allow the bird to uh, generate thrust or a secondary feather that allows it to generate lift and to fly. It's going to be something very small, perhaps something that um, is more like a tiny little spike, maybe that allows it uh, a little bit more defense or maybe a little bit longer still uh, as uh, something similar to a hair-like projection. Birds to this day still have um, bristles and other types of feathers, phyloplumes, for example, that are very hair-like in appearance. And, and this might have allowed the bird to have increased insulation. As those feathers continued to get a little bit more developed, maybe some pigmentation went in there, um, some reds, some uh, blacks, things like this to allow for social signaling where a male could maybe show his color, we'll talk about this in a little while, show his color to advertise his attractiveness to females or to show his color to advertise his virility, his, his strength to repel rival males who might try to usurp his territory. And then over time, as these feathers continue to elongate to, and to uh, become a little bit more structured with those secondary and tertiary structures, uh, then those feathers could be what's said to be co-opted. They could be changed in their function or their function could be added such that then they allowed for flight. Uh, but the original development of feathers, the evolution of feathers was not direct, was, I don't want to say directed, was not uh, such that it gave an advantage of those individuals that they could fly. The feathers were too rudimentary, too small. Uh, but they would allow for perhaps some sort of defense, certainly for insulation and at some point social signaling. And it was only later that these uh, feathers were useful for flight. All right, so if we go ahead and look globally at birds, all birds belong to uh, a single class, Aedes. We have about 30 orders or so worldwide. This is always, not always, this has changed us a little bit. And, and we have about 18 of those orders represented here in Tennessee. And um, there's about 200 families. And altogether, there's somewhere, ballpark figure, 10,000 species across the globe. Within the Mid-South region, we have somewhere around, generally speaking, 350 species that'll be here during the year. Certainly all those species are not here at any one time or in even any one year, but we have somewhere in the ballpark figure of 350 species here in the Mid-South region. And this diversity of birds just isn't clear in, in, in terms of obvious, in terms of the number of species, but the morphological diversity, the diversity that we have in the size of birds and the shapes of birds, in the ways that birds make a living, the habitats they use, the, the things they feed on 
is just astounding. Um, so morphological diversity, we can have something as small as a, a bee hummingbird from Cuba up here in the upper right. It uh, just weighs two grams. It's barely larger than the, the tip of a pencil. And then we can get all the way up to things like ostriches, which are, are somewhere in the ballpark of, you know, 100 kilograms, 220 pounds or so. And it's not just the size diversity. With, within a given size, we're going to have birds of all different shapes. So you have things like albatrosses with these really long, wings that are really evolved to provide lift and then other types of adaptations in forest birds that really allow them this explosiveness to burst out quickly. Uh, and then you have other types of, of, of species that have been uh, evolved to be aquatic, right? So you have all sorts of, of different adaptations here that we can see. And this power of natural selection can sometimes be really astounding. So with molecular methods now, being able to go ahead and, and look at the DNA of different organisms, we can see some relationships, some evolutionary relationships that we never would have envisioned a long time ago. So, so for example, if you go ahead and look at falcons, all right, so falcons, something like an American kestrel, and compare that to, say, a red-tailed hawk. Well, these are both birds, they are raptors, they feed on, uh, in, this, in the case of kestrels, large insects and, and small, small mammals, red-tailed hawks feed on um, large, mid size to larger size, size mammals, they have these raptorial bills, they have talons, and yet they are not closely related at all. What you can see from this is that falcons are actually more closely related to things like parrots and songbirds. A falcon is more closely related to an American robin, right, than it is to a red-tailed hawk. And conversely, red-tailed hawks are more closely related to another raptor, the owls, for example, and even to woodpeckers than they are related to falcons. And so through this natural selection, working to advance, to promote the, the, the traits of these birds that allow them to survive and reproduce in these different environments, we see in some cases convergent evolution where you have similar appearances in birds, even though they are not closely related. All right, so as we think about birds, let's go ahead and think what are birds, all right? So uh, we know that they're animals, we know that they're chordates, they're vertebrates. Uh, and when we think about vertebrates, we usually think about things like fish, right? Like a large mouth bass. Um, we think about amphibians, spring peeper, for example, chorus frog. Mammals, we think about things like squirrels, humans, right? And then reptiles, lizards, snakes, turtles, things like this. Uh, and then we have this group birds over here, right? So let's get to this next question. What are birds? Matt, would you put that next question up, please? All right, so birds are birds. So what are birds? A, birds are birds, distinct from all other vertebrate groups. B, birds are dinosaurs. C, birds are reptiles. D, birds are dinosaurs and reptiles. All right, let's go ahead and get your votes in in the next five or 10 seconds, please. All right, so the most common answer was birds are birds distinct from all other vertebrate groups, followed by birds are both dinosaurs and reptiles. Well, let's go ahead and see what the data show, all right? Well, first, birds are in fact reptiles, all right? So if we go ahead and look at this branching diagram here, uh, this is called a phylogeny. We've already seen one. These show the evolutionary relationships among different groups, right? And so we can go ahead and look here and see that if we go ahead and think about crocodilians, turtles, lizards and snakes, dinosaurs, birds are nested within this large group. So this entire group right here would be reptiles. And so birds are a subgroup of reptiles. And on top of that, pardon me, birds are a type of dinosaur, which you can see from right here. 
So you thought you were getting a talk tonight on birds. You're actually getting a talk on extant or still living dinosaurs. So that's pretty exciting. Get your kids interested in some, some ornithology and science and conservation. And so here we can go ahead and look at a much more sophisticated phylogeny. It shows the same type of thing. It shows these evolutionary relationships among different groups. And what you can see right here is a phylogeny of the dinosaurs. So we're going back uh, uh, you know, 65 plus million years ago. We had the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. This one little lineage of dinosaur that we now call birds survived that mass extinction event 65 million years ago. After that, birds radiated to fill niches. Mammals as well radiated to fill those vacant niches that had been vacated with the extinction of those non-avian dinosaurs. And so we can go ahead and, and think about birds as this subset, this relatively small lineage of dinosaurs. And just to avoid any confusion, um, birds are not closely related to pterosaurs. Pterosaurs, in fact, are not even dinosaurs at all. So if we go back and look at this large reptile phylogeny, if you will, again, including things like lizards and snakes, the crocodilians, pterosaurs are out here kind of in their own group. And then within this group right here would be all the dinosaurs. And these here would be the, uh, these would be called the bird hip dinosaurs. These would be things like uh, triceratops, for example, would be in, in this type of group. And this ornith prefix here, you probably recognize means bird. What this means is bird hip dinosaurs. Birds though are not in that bird hipped group. They're over here in this other lineage that includes things like T-Rex. And you can see here though, that within this dinosaur uh, phylogeny, this dinosaur clade, this group of organisms, that birds are one of these uh, lineages and it is the only one that is still surviving. So of surviving lineages of reptiles, the most uh, closely related organisms that is still extant would be these crocodilians, crocodiles, alligators, and caimans example, right? So, so learning a few different things about what actually is a bird. Oh, and I'll also say what I also meant to say is that we also know from this dinosaur phylogeny that a lot of dinosaurs were also feathered. The, uh, the, the quality of these feathers that we're getting, there's a whole slew of fossils coming out, not just of North America, but really coming out of China right now are incredibly good that really allow us to look at uh, in incredible detail in, in some of these fossils that are coming out. And, and we know that many of these dinosaurs were feathered. So that brings us back to that earlier question about unique traits of birds. Well, bills would still be unique to birds, but feathers would be unique to birds if you all think about extant living things. But if you think about the broader tree of life going back in time to say 65, 100, 150 million years ago, there were likely a lot of dinosaur species, many of which were feathered. It looks like a good number of them were endothermic. Uh, a number of them gave parental care. So quite a bit different from uh, the view of dinosaurs that I think many of us might have had, uh, say, just 20 or so years ago. All right. So looking at the uh, behavior of birds, one of the first things that you see from a lot of birds is is, is that they are migratory and, and they go through what's called the annual cycle. So if we go ahead and move to this part of the year right here, we just are in the sort of the tail end of spring migration right now. All these birds are coming back and things like American red starts and all sorts of species are coming back from the Caribbean, Central America and South America. And, and, and to me, it just feels like seeing a friend for a long time. And, and my son says, don't, don't say that. That makes you seem really lonely. But it, I, it is something I really look forward to every year. All these beautiful birds uh, coming back to North America after spending about the last six months down in, in South and Central America. And in response to these increased day lengths and temperature, these birds will move into breeding. So some of them, um, many of the birds that we have that are residents, robins and and jays and things like this are already breeding, already having fledglings coming out. At the end of the breeding season, sometime maybe in August, birds will go through a molt. Even juveniles that just hatched out here in this, in, in say June, will go through a, and, and have pretty much brand new feathers. Those feather, feathers are really low quality. They'll go through and do a complete molt here in August or so. As we start moving into September, the birds then go through fall migration. This is in response to decreased photo periods, shorter days, cooler temperatures. And as they uh, then migrate to their overwintering grounds, they will continue to then overwinter until again, some species go through a, a partial or even complete molt and then 
begin spring migration again. So this here is known as, as the annual cycle. It's common in, in many species of, of bird. Um, and, and so this migration is, is a type of, of movement that's predictable, it's tied to seasonal opportunities, and it happens in mass. So you have lots of individuals all moving in a particular direction. So this is different from dispersal where individuals are, are moving in, in more or less random directions. This is predictable. It happens in mass with the vast majority of individuals of a population moving more or less at about the same time. And so you get this repeated regular cycle of, of departures and returns. And while I tend to, I think many people tend to think about these neotropical migrants, right? Um, birds such as this handsome summer tanager um, that will breed up here in North America and then migrate down to Central and, and South America. We also have migration of species such as this white-throated sparrow um, that is found here in this part of the country in the southeastern United States only in the winter and then migrates back up to the north to, to breed in the, in the summer. And we also have altitudinal migrants. Robins, for example, in the western part of the United States might only migrate 10 miles, but they migrate down 2,000 meters in elevation and move to uh, warmer conditions. And so we can think about these types of, of migrations at, at, at different spatial scales, um, and, but we can sort of lump them into uh, inter versus intracontinental migratory species. Right? And we can go ahead and look at these migration routes. Um, but I, I think a more interesting question is, why do you think birds migrate? So Matt, would you put up the next slide, please? Not the next slide, pardon me, the next question. Thank you. All right, so why do birds migrate? A, to find unpredictable food resources. B, to stay warm during the winter. C, to find predictable resources in summer. Or D, it's instinctual and cannot be changed. like another tight race here. Go ahead and cast your vote in the next five or 10 seconds if you haven't already done so, please. And uh, Michael, I will ask uh, you four questions after this slide if you like. That will be wonderful, Kathy, yes, please. Okay. Okay, so the top answer was to find predictable resources in summer. That is the correct answer. So let's go through and you know about 60% of us pick something else. So let's go ahead and, and see why we might be a little bit mistaken here, right? So it is true in a sense, in a sense, that birds migrate south for the winter to stay warm. But if we go ahead and think about the recent geologic history of North America and go back to say, I don't know, 18,000 years ago, if you went to Ohio, what would you encounter? Well, you would encounter a glacier one to two miles high. Not too many birds are gonna be there, right? So at least from Ohio northward, it was really inhospitable, zero birds. Everything was, was basically, everything above the micro, microbiota was, was, was erased, right? And we still see species of tree, for example, to this day in 2021, continuing to move northward in response to the last glaciation. And so birds were pushed down into the tropics. And in the tropics, there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of species, which means a lot of competitors, and a lot of predators, right? So there's a lot of activity, competition for resources, risk of being eaten yourself. And as the, we moved into the interglacial cycle, these resources, these abundant resources, these pulses of resources, inchworms, uh, mosquitoes, mayflies, things like this. You go to a, a lake up in Michigan in the summer, and in May and June, they are the, the surface of the lake is just covered with the carcasses of, of insects that have, have emerged, mated, and died and fallen into the lake. And so these species that we see largely in North America that are migratory evolved from tropical species that had previously spent their entire annual cycle in the tropics. As that glacial uh, melt and recession continued, some individuals migrated up. Those individuals that migrated up into North America, on average, survived better, had more offspring. Those genes were then passed on. And we saw the evolution of migratory behavior in these formerly tropical species. And, and so this gives us 
a, a different way, I think, of thinking about migration in turn, in, instead of they go south for the winter to stay warm. And this migration has is coincides with predictable pulses of resources. Species that are not able to find resources predictably become nomadic and move around almost in a haphazard way until they find it. And when they find that resource, they take it and they will breed often opportunistically uh, wherever they are at whatever time of year. But migratory species are really following those resources in space and those resources shift seasonally and across space and time then in a very predictable way, right? So, so these birds have these, in some cases, Herculean migratory behaviors. And my favorite is this bar-tailed godwit. This is a shorebird here. It doesn't occur in Tennessee, but it's my, my favorite migratory species. There's other species that move more in, a, in, in the year, um, but this one is just absolutely phenomenal. So the bar-tailed godwit breeds all the way up here. If you can't tell where we are right here, this is the Pacific, right? So this is the Pacific. Here's Hawaii, kind of put us a little bit on the map. And up in here, it's hard to see, but up in here is Alaska. Here are the Aleutian Islands that come out. And this bar-tailed godwit, in about the last two to three weeks, after uh, or before fall migration will more or less double its body weight. So it doubles its body weight in 15 days. Then it begins its migratory journey where it wants to come down here and overwinter on some of these islands. And to do this, this bar-tailed godwit flies for eight days nonstop. It is going at a pace that's metabolically comparable to us running a four to four and a half minute mile nonstop for eight days straight. On top of that, it does it with, I don't know what is worse, no sleep, no food, and no water. This is just physiologically astounding. To make this journey possible, it'll put on equal its weight in fat. It shrinks the organs that it's not going to use during this migratory trip. It shrinks its gonads down to a, a few percent of the size during the breeding season. It shrinks the digestive system because it's not going to eat for eight days. Why do you want to carry around this stomach, this cropping gizzard the whole way? It shrinks its leg muscles. It increases the size of its heart. It increases the size of its pectoral muscle and it puts on a tremendous amount of fat to burn as fuel. On top of this, the burning of fat versus the burning of muscle generates different types of metabolic water. So as you exercise, you're, one of the byproducts besides carbon dioxide is water. And so as these birds are migrating, they can shift the fuel they burn from fat to muscle if they need to increase their water intake, if you will, their water production. Um, but keep in mind that as you burn, if you burn pectoral muscle, you are losing the ability to continue to sustain flight. So the, the physiological challenges of this are absolutely amazing. On top of that, you can see from this map that the number of islands here in the Western Pacific is large, but these islands are pretty darn small. And so how are they able to orient themselves? How are they able to navigate? So orientation is being able to say, this particular way is say north. That might be difficult for some of us here, right? Um, but many of us could do it. But navigation is more than that. Navigation is being able to say, which way is north and which direction do I have to fly to get from where I am to where I need to be? Which direction do I fly to be at my overwintering island? Which direction do I fly to go back to my breeding season? That, that's, that, those are different things. You need to know where you are and the, the direction from where you are. Uh, and so navigation is a, is a more, is a higher hurdle, if you will. So how do birds do this? Well, the short of it is, is that they use almost everything you can imagine, right? So migration strategies are, I found this really surprising when I first learned this, are easily evolved. They evolve very quickly. So these species that uh, in response to climate change, I think migration will, will be one of the things that birds are able to do. We'll be able to do a better job at tracking, I think, climate change than we, than we might expect. But these migration strategies are both species and population specific. So you might have species that are, uh, say, uh, 
breeding in the northwestern part of Canada, other ones are say breeding in eastern Canada, and they might overwinter in the same place in South America, they're going to migrate in different directions. You might have individuals that are breeding here in Tennessee, they're going to migrate a different distance, right, than those ones that are in say eastern Canada. And so they have differences across species and even across populations within a species in terms of the di direction and also the distance that they migrate. And as they use uh, these different cues to navigate, they will use visual landmarks. So they will follow up coastlines, for example. They will uh, follow up things like the Mississippi River, which is a big migratory corridor. Um, they will use a sun compass, uh, which is pretty interesting. And, and so they can go ahead and correct their flight by the time of day, right? So as the sun rises in the east and then starts to get up high and then starts to set in the west, they will continue to offset. So they have an internal daily clock that allows them to continue to adjust more or less the direction they're flying to account for the shift in the sun, right? They use a star compass. Uh, and so we can go ahead and, and look at these uh, uh, constellations and know that birds, in fact, use the stars to navigate at night. Most birds actually fly at night. The air is cooler. So keep in mind that they are flying and for tens of hours at a time, many of these species. And so they generate tremendous amounts of energy, tremendous amounts of heat. So at night, it tends to be a little bit cooler. The air is also more calm. And then as they are able to uh, land during the day, they are then able to, in many cases, visit stopover sites and refuel so they can continue on with their migratory journey. So we know that they use a sun compass. We know that they use a star compass as well. And they're also able to use the Earth's magnetic field to sense the magnetic direction, sense which way is, is north, and from there, which way do they need to go. And as interesting as, as some of these aspects are, some of these cues that bird, different species of bird use to navigate, I think it's even more fantastic to think about the science that went into this and the creativity that went into understanding some of these questions. How, for example, do we know that... Oh, sorry, Kathy, I forgot. You had a bunch of questions to ask of me. I don't know. <laughs> it's great that you're so interesting. I hate to interrupt you. Um, why don't I ask um, two questions and then we'll move on. I can save, uh, we can all ask the majority at the end. How about that? Sure. Okay, so here's a question uh, that's relevant to migration. So some birds like uh, ge some geese and others stay in the cold, like in Chicago, how do they survive? In freezing weather? That's a that's a wonderful question and the answer is, is it depends uh, and, and so uh, many species uh, things like geese will have access to open water as those uh, water bodies tend to uh, freeze up things tend to start to move further south um, but you have some that are still able to continue to forage so you can think about um, breeding is like this too that you, you know you have income breeders and capital breeders and, and so a bird either needs to have fat reserves in order to stay warm and to continue to maintain its metabolic processes, homeostasis, or it needs to have continual food to do that. And so some, some species are able to feed uh, throughout the winter. Other species, you know, if you think about a, a Carolina chickadee right here, it gets pretty cold here, but you have chickadees, boreal chickadees, black capped chickadees farther north. How the heck do birds like that, little bird like this, survive in these frigid temperatures? They cache food, they store food all uh, fall, and then they are able to go back to those largely seed resources during the winter and continue to maintain high caloric intake, which they usually very quickly burn through just to stay warm. And, and then there are some species that uh, actually huddle together in, um, in sometimes pretty decent sized uh, groups and huddle together for, to uh, conserve energy and keep each other warm. Okay. Excellent question. Another it's one, another Kathy? Here's another migration related question. Do any animals other than birds use na navigation to migrate? Uh, to use these cues, you know, I don't know about that. There are other species that migrate, including some that we might not think about. So there are some fantastic migrations of mammals, for example, both in Africa and even here in North America. But if you think about things like, um, organisms in fresh water. They actually navigate every single day. So you have a whole suite of species, things like Daphne and these tiny little organisms and even some small fish will migrate up at night to feed at night. But as that sun rises, they are small, they're vulnerable to predators and 
they migrate back down. And so these small little things like Daphne will migrate up every night and back every morning to avoid those, those dangerous uh, conditions. Um, so yeah, so there are other species that migrate. Some species of bat migrate um, and, uh, and, and that would be very similar to, to birds. Nothing migrates with these Herculean things of, of eight days across continents the way that birds do, um, to my knowledge. Um, I wonder if the monarch butterfly might qualify as. So bird. that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I'm sure some people from, from this group know this, but some probably don't. The monarch butterfly, in a sense, is even a more remarkable story. And the reason for this is that the birds migrate, a single individual will migrate, right? Uh, let's say you have a, a prothonotary warbler that hatches out right, you know, next month in 2021. It'll migrate in the fall. It'll overwinter. It'll migrate back. And it'll do this every year through the annual cycle until it dies. Monarchs are different in that no individual survives the entire journey. So you'll have an individual that say hatches out in Tennessee or, or you know, wherever. And depending on the time of year, that individual will then say migrate south to Mexico, or it might continue to migrate north up to Canada, depending on the time of year. But the ind a single individual only completes a small part of that annual cycle, if you will, um, and, and, and so it's, I think that's even more remarkable uh, that it, it knows which direction to go. It'll migrate then, it will then die. It could then reproduce, you know, and its offspring then would turn around and start to migrate the other direction because it's a different time of year. And, and so depending on, you know, the, the stage of that individual, what cycle it's in at what time of year, it'll migrate in different directions. And someone also commented that whales make long migrations. Which oh, is yes, of course. Whales. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Me and my terrestrial bias. A shame. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, stop the questions there for now. It's seven, it's 11 after 7 just for you, and I'm going to let you continue with your program. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll motor through some of this. And, and so for some of these things, like the, the star compass, scientists put birds in a planetarium and turned the, the, the star compass uh, or the, the star compass around in different direction and sure enough the birds started orienting in a different way with the geomagnetism we now know that this comes from a particular um, uh, nerve in the birds uh, basically in its olfactory and face and into the bill um, and and that it's able to sense magnetic direction and to understand this not not just the mechanism but the birds were able to do it they put little magnets helmets with magnets on the bird to kind of uh, blind them from from the these signals and basically um different species will use different cues but they tend to use these in combination so that uh they have a backup plan if you will so that uh they're able to if one cue is not working if it's too cloudy and they can't use the sun for example then they can go ahead and use be a uh, uh, star compass or, or something else, geomagnetic compass, right? And so birds have really shown us a lot about mating systems. I want to talk about a couple of these right here, um, about monogamy in particular, because birds are the most well-known group that does this in a sense. Um, but many species of bird are also polyg um, um, polygamous, um, either having um, one male with multiple females, polygyny, or in a few cases, one female with her uh, uh, male harem, if you will. So some species of shorebird are polyandrous. All right, and so this, these monogamous pairs uh, really evolve in species uh, when it requires a prolonged pair bond uh, to re, uh, rear young. And so when uh, in difficult conditions where it takes two parents to provide the food uh, for, to, to rear, rear young successfully, you tend to see monogamy evolve. When a single individual can do that on its own, males then start to uh, move towards a more uh, polygynous type of system. And so while we think of birds as being this monogamous thing, it turns out that it's a little bit sexier than that. Only about 14 species that are socially monogamous, that look like they form monogamous, monogamous pairs, are actually genetically monogamous. So there are, there's hanky-panky going on in what we call extra pair copulations. And so the question becomes, you know, why do females engage in these extra pair copulations? And, and there's a number of reasons for this. Um, and that uh, females might really be looking for an insurance against infertility. If her mate is infertile, um, then she is basically wasting her reproductive season. It might be some advantage for her to mix up her genes with some other males, or maybe the male of the territory over is genetically superior, seems to be of a higher quality than the male that she's pair bonded with, and she would be better off pairing her genes, if you will, with the genes of the neighboring male, while her social mate helps her to raise the other male and her 
offspring, right? And so this gets the idea of sexual selection. There's different hypotheses for this, one of which is the good genes hypothesis, which uh, suggests that these males that have traits that females find sexy, these nice red breasts in house finches, these striking colors of scarlet tanagers, these are all male birds, by the way, um, that this conveys some honest sig signal, it's a truthful signal that really says, hey, I have a good territory, I have good genes, I have genes that allow me to reduce my parasite load, I would make a good mate because I'll pass those healthy gene on to your offspring. Um, we have other species that are uh, brood parasites. Brown-headed cowbird is the main one we have here in, in North America. And these things uh, don't build their own nests. Instead, they go ahead and look for another uh, bird. As that female then leaves the nest, the cowbird will then fly in and drop one of her eggs in there. Their eggs are able to be matched to the, the egg uh, patterning of their host. And in some cases, they remove one of those eggs. This is a fantastic story. We don't have time to get into it. The story with um, common or Eurasian cuckoos in Europe is even more interesting, right? Um, but I want to spend a little bit of time going through conservation. We have a lot of conservation programs directed at birds. Um, and as passionate as I am about birds, I, I, I really think of them as, as indicators for habitat, habitat quality, maintaining watersheds and, and things like this. Um, and Right now, we know that we're in the sixth mass extinction. Extinction rates are two to three orders of magnitude higher than they normally would be. And basically this graph right, this uh, diagram down here shows that historically over the last 40, 50,000 years, wherever humans have gone, extinctions have followed. Um, climate change has certainly played a role in this, but humans look like we're uh, playing our fair share too. We've had about 130 extinctions over the last 400 years. Most of these are on islands. More alarmingly, about 12% of birds are right now threatened with extinction. And if we go ahead and look closer to home in North America, half of species of North American birds are declining and about two thirds of, of grassland species are declining. These threats to birds, the main one is habitat loss, urbanization, in particular loss to agriculture. But when we go ahead and enact programs like the CRP, um, Conservation Reserve Program to basically reacquire, to reclaim fallow um, ag lands, birds will respond, things like grasshopper, sparrows come back. And with Matt, could you go ahead and, and pass the next um, question, please? All right, so other than habitat loss, what is the biggest threat to birds? Invasive species, including cats, climate change, collisions with buildings, human apathy. All right, go ahead and get your votes in in the next five or 10 seconds, please. All right, so climate change at 45%, followed by invasive species. Uh, pretty much, I think, any of these answers, you could make a, a valid argument that you think this could be one of the, the, the maybe the second leading thing after habitat loss. And we'll go through it and look at some of these. And some of it depends on what species are you talking about? Are you looking forward in time or backwards in time? Right. So if we go ahead and look at the historical threats to birds, sure enough, invasive species have been horrible, especially on islands. We know that just in North America, feral cats, trap neuter release programs are disastrous for birds and other wildlife. Feral cats kill somewhere on the order of 3 billion would-be birds in the U.S. alone each year. They are horrible. Things like the brown tree snake wiped out the native birds of Guam. Other predators we might not think of as rats and mice as being bird predators. Well, they don't prey on adults, but they can really take out eggs and nestlings. Collisions are another big one. So birds are, are, are kind of unique in this case, um, but another billion birds fly into uh, windows uh, each year in the United States. Many millions fly into cars. Another number of millions fly into communication towers but collisions with windows are another huge problem for bird populations. And then direct exploitation. Uh, just going back to the 30s, we can think about things like the National Wildlife Refuge System to try to recover duck populations. We can think about things like the passenger pigeon that went extinct a little over 100 years ago. This once used to be the most numerous bird in the entire United States, now extinct. Carolina parakeet, right here in the southeastern good part of the eastern United States, also extinct about 100 years ago. And 
And, and so we can think about these main threats to birds as we look in the mirror. As we look forward, I think climate change, uh, globalization, and this idea of uh, pollution too. And But there's also this idea of a human disconnect with nature. If you haven't read um, any of Lou's stuff, nature deficit disorder is a real thing. As more and more people, more and more Americans, for example, are living in an in urbanized area, people care less. I, I, I can't tell you how many people I've met from Memphis that have never even been, let alone been to the Ghost River. Some of them don't even uh, know it. And it's heartbreaking because you have this amazing resource an hour from Memphis. And if they don't know it exists, if they don't uh, value it, they're not going to be interested in paying to conserve it. Right? But there's hope. We have things like the Endangered Species Act that have helped recover bald eagle, peregrine falcons, other brown pelicans would be on, on that list as well. We are working collectively with government agencies at the federal and state level, with not NGOs, people like Wolf, people like, you know, organizations like Wolf River, Partners in Flight does a lot of this. There's a lot of citizen science stuff that you can get involved with. Things from Project Feeder Watch, if you want to sit on your couch with your cup of coffee, to the Great Backyard Bird Count and do the same, to CBCs, Christmas Bird Counts, and Bringing Bird Surveys. And we just had World Migratory Bird Day uh, last Saturday. So there's lots of opportunities for people to get interested. If you like birds, if you, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here because I think the Wolf River and the Tennessee Ornithological Society do a lot of stuff uh, similarly. We're interested in protecting habitats. Um, and so if you're interested in, in learning more about birds, we're happy to take anybody of all levels. We meet the third Wednesday of the month at St. George's over there in Germantown uh, at 7 p.m. So if you're interested, um, you can check out 10birds.org, has a bunch of different things. What I'd like to do now is kind of go through just some neat birds that you might see um, first in the city and then what you might expect to see at Wolf River. And so you might be amazed that, at, that people can go ahead and, and look at a diagram like this and I identify some of these birds from their silhouettes alone. But if you think about being able to identify your friends and family members, you can do this because you're familiar with them and birding is, is no different. Um, so as you're around your uh, house, driving around the town, walking in Overton or something like this, um, uh, you might have things like tufted titmice, uh, white-breasted nuthatch, uh, Carolina chickadees coming in into your, your feeder. These are some of the more common feeder birds that we get. House finches and goldfinches come into feeders quite regularly. Um, Dark-eyed juncos, white-throated sparrows, these are two species that are here only in the winter. And then we have the house sparrow that's a bit of an invasive species that is, uh, it, it is around quite a bit as well. We have some other common species, northern cardinals, European starling, another invasive species here um, that are just absolutely, um, these guys are, are absolutely little buggers here. Um, woodpeckers come into feeders quite a bit. Now, two other good backyard birds, red belly woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers. And I don't want to give you guys the impression that this is all the birds that you're going to see. There are other woodpeckers that you might see, and, and the same is true for the, the Wolf River section. Um, but we have other species that um, uh, come into feeders, golden crown and ruby crown kinglets are two nervous little warbler-like birds that are here again only in the winter. Cedar waxwings, I just saw them today, are going to be bugging out up to Michigan and Canada here any week now, but they are, are still around here also um, during the, the winter months. A um, couple other uh, birds that are in the thrush family, American robin and eastern bluebirds uh, are here, residents year-round, just absolutely striking both of both of these guys. Carolina wrens, um, cavity nesters, northern mockingbirds, prolific singers. If you hear birds singing at night, good chance it's a northern mockingbird, especially if there's any light left on outside. Corvids, American crows, blue jays, two of the uh, smarter birds that we have in this area, just absolutely um, brilliant birds, um, handsome birds. Grackles, brown-headed cowbird, we've talked about earlier already, and this is the brood parasite. This is what the male looks like um, and lays its eggs in the nest of, of other birds. And if you go ahead and look up as you're walking around town, walking your dog or walking uh, around the neighborhood, you might see things like Mississippi kites. These guys I just saw migrated back a little over a week ago. They overwintered down in South America. I just saw them back. Look at these long silhouetted pointed wings, long tail. We can contrast that with these short rounded wings of a Cooper's hawk, but also has a long tail. And we can contrast that with say this red tail hawk, which has these relatively long but rounded wings and a relatively short tail. So, so you can go ahead and start to see some of the similarities, but also some of the differences in, in some of these, these different groups. 
continuing to, to look up, you can see black and turkey vultures around. Um, and then if you see an owl in the city, good chance it's a, it's a barred owl. They have that pretty distinctive hoo -hoo -hoo -hoo, um, call. And then if you look up and see some tiny little guys, these uh, might be chimney swifts. They have this Di -di 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 type of vocalization, or they could be uh, these uh, purple martins. Both of these are migratory uh, neotropical migrants. So they have just recently migrated um, back to the Memphis area in the last month. Now, if you are having a better day and can get out to the Wolf River for a nice paddle, uh, this is me with some of my, my students from several years ago out on the, the Wolf River. Um, you can get out there and students are blown away. Many of them, this is the first time they've seen bald eagles. And, you know, an adult bald eagle is unmistakable with that uh, white and uh, head and tail. Um, but keep in mind that juvenile bald eagles look a bit different uh, and are sometimes mistaken for uh, golden eagles in, in particular. Um, and for me, when I get out to the Wolf River, my favorite species that I see a bird is, are these prothonotary warblers. So this is a small insectivorous bird. Unlike most warblers, this is a cavity nesting bird. So they nest in little cavities of, of these, you know, gum trees and things like this that are out there. Another handsome warbler that's pretty common out there is hooded warbler. But as you're paddling through the, the Ghost River section in particular, you'll see these brilliant iridescent yellow guys zipping around most of them are going to be these prothonotary warblers. Um, and, and there's other species of warbler, common yellow throats, Kentuckys, uh, Northern Perulas, American Red Star. So there's a tremendous amount of, of variety. The uh, plethodontid salamanders that the eastern part of the state is known for is uh, in terms of the highest diversity of, of those salamanders in the world. Here we have this incredible radiation of, of warblers in, in Eastern North America. So everything doesn't go well for me and my students. Here's a, a couple of students that have fallen. Here's us trying to, trying to help them recover. Um, I've, my students have lost pairs of binoculars in the Wolf River. I apologize for, for littering, but there's, I like to think that there is treasure out there to be discovered by some, some fortunate paddler at, at some point. Other warbler or warbler-like birds would include like Louisiana water thrush, Swainson's warbler, blue-gray gnat catchers. These guys are, are all flitting around pretty, pretty nervous-like. Some larger birds you might see, great egrets are out there most of the time, woodies, uh, wood ducks, pardon me, great blue herons, lots of bird diversity out here. Pileated woodpeckers, one of my favorite birds, red-headed woodpeckers, just absolutely striking. So when you, when you see the red-bellied in town, people say, why don't they call it a red-headed? This is why. This is the red-headed woodpecker, as you can see. And so the other species that we have here more in town is uh, the red-bellied woodpecker. We have different species, eastern kingbirds, Acadian flycatcher. Acadians make this pizza type of, type of call. Um, different types of vireo, red and white-eyed vireos, uh, relatively uh, small to medium-sized insectivorous birds, both vocalize quite a bit and are, are common along different parts of the wolf. Tanagers, just these absolutely striking birds. We've already seen the scarlet tanager down in the, in the bottom right. Summer tanagers tend to be more common, um, but similarly beautiful birds. Um, and then if you go ahead and uh, really in that Ghost River section, you'll see good numbers of barn swallows, tree swallows. You see this out at Bateman Bridge and pretty much any bridge you're going to see barn swallows here. Um, and red-winged blackbirds are there along um, some of the river channels and the, the Ghost River section as well. Um, and then this are, aren't really birds that you're going to see, but I just had to show you guys some of the, the beautiful birds that we have. We have a couple of species of bunting, indigo bunting and painted bunting here. Um, both of these things, indigos are quite common out at Shelby Farms, for example. These guys are much less common. Gross beaks are less common as well and can easily be confused with the indigo buntings, but they're, they're bigger and have this reddish color in the shoulder. But we have this just tremendous diversity of birds here. And again, I think birds can be a fantastic way to do some citizen science to help us understand understand how well and what we can do better to help protect landscapes, watersheds, and so forth. So I think I've gone a little bit long. But I want to thank Wolf River for giving me the opportunity to share my passion for birds with you guys today. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, anything about birds, Tennessee Ornithological Society, anything, please do that. And with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions if, if people should have any. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. I'll put myself, my video on so I can ask these questions. Um, let's see, let me start here. Are scarlet tanagers becoming a common sight in a backyard? Oh, you know, so this is, so the answer is I don't know. I, I don't think so. I don't hear them a lot. 
Um, but one of the nice things about these citizen sciences is, is there's a, and I, I should have put this in here, is, is eBird. If you don't know about eBird, go to eBird.org and you can go in and look at Shelby County. You can go to hot spots and look what's going on, let's say Overton Park or what's going on at Shelby Farms or and whatever area. And you can go ahead and click and see how many of these things are, are being observed on a pretty much real time basis. And so um, things in the last hour aren't reported, but you can go on there and see what was seen yesterday, what was seen this morning. Um, and so, so I don't think scarlets are increasing. I, I certainly could be wrong, but I have not heard of that and I have not observed that myself. Okay, there's another question. What predators eat Eastern Phoebes? Ooh, Eastern Phoebes. Okay, so uh, I would say if you're having something that's taken an Eastern Phoebe, my probably first guess would be something like a Cooper's hawk or a cat. Uh, I'm guessing this is likely a Phoebe's nest do very well around, around um, human dominated landscape. So I'm guessing this is something relatively close to, to town. Um, and, and so if it's a, a pile of feathers just kind of sitting there, um, good chance it was a cat. Um, Cooper's hawks often drag their things away and, and sever the head. Um, and so they tend to have a bit different signatures, if you will. Um, and then the other case is it's a bit early for, uh, for fledglings, I think, for Phoebes to be out. But as fledglings get out, it could even be um, other things like, a, you know, a raccoon or something like this that catches a fledgling that's just a little slow and not able to fly very well. But cat and Cooper's hawk would be the highest on my list. Okay. Um, I'll ask, this is an important one. When you say feral cats, are you including house cats? Any cat that gets outside. So that means your cat. If you let your cat out, there's a good chance it's, it's killing birds. And as bad as the, the bird mortality is, mammals and small reptiles seem to be taking it even worse. Uh, and, and so some of these cats, it's, it's their instinct, right? We've had this relationship with cats for now thousands of years to try to keep small pest populations down. They don't, you know, if you keep them fill, full, doesn't matter. This is, this is their instinct. I'm not saying cats are bad. This, this, this is natural selection at work here. This is what they do, if you will. Um, but yeah, if you let your cat outside, there's a good chance it's, it's killing birds and other organisms. And, and it's also a higher chance that your cat is going to get lost, get killed, get some disease, get in a fight. So I think it works better for both birds and cats to keep cats indoors. Um, here is an evolution question. How did birds survive when all the di other dinos went extinct? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good question. And you know, one thing I'd like to not underestimate is the role of chance, the role of chance. We tend to think about our lives being guided by the decisions we make. And that makes, I think, gives us a false sense that we have more control over our lives than we think. We like to look back at the stock market and say, it went up because of this and it went down because of that. And evolution, I think, can be kind of similar. We can look back in hindsight and say, okay, well, you had these, um, you know, an impact 65 million years ago somewhere in, in near Yucatan Peninsula. Um, but a lot of dinosaurs were endothermic. They had feathers. They weren't all that different from birds. So I think a lot of it is bad luck. And the converse then would be that birds had good luck. And so as that climate changes, you have some individuals that sometimes people use the word pre-adapted, right? And so you can think about a similar thing going on now. What, what allows certain birds to do better in urbanized areas and other birds do poorly? And, and here we have a better idea that um, some it, it's largely luck in the sense that birds that have bigger brains have less what's called neophobia. They're not afraid of new things as much. So they're able to tolerate humans and vehicular noise and cars and dogs and other things. Um, and on top of that, they tend to be more generalists. So in general, over broader periods of time, specialists, when there's a big change in climate, something like that, specialists get knocked down and the generalists tend to kind of survive that, that uh, difficult time and then radiate, specialize. And, and I think the process often repeats. This is sometimes you know, a, a cyclical type of thing almost. Okay. Um, I think the person, I, I will just read this question, but I would ask the person who submitted it to perhaps ask it in a different way. What time did the birds evolve to have birds and how? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, I'm not sure, but if, some, if somebody wants to um, 
clarify that, I'd be happy to try to answer it. But while, while we're sort of on a, perhaps a slimmer topic, you know, there's a question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And, and there's an answer. Uh, the answer is the egg, right? So eggs evolved far before birds, right? So a chicken being a bird uh, evolved much later than any sort of egg, including the cladoic egg. So you had dinosaurs that laid, laid eggs well before um, birds, for example. You had other reptiles that laid eggs well before birds evolved. So that in one sense, the answer would be that eggs um, came before chickens. Um, and then there's, there's some other reasons that you could argue that as, as well, but I don't want to get into those, those details. But I would say the answer is the egg. Okay. Um, do blue jays hide food inside fences? Inside fences. I would say, I, I don't know for a fact, but I would say yes. Blue jays, corvids, blue jays, nutcrackers, crows, ravens, they're among, along with parrots, are considered probably the two smartest orders of birds, or one's a family, one's an order. Um, and and they, they have what's even known as, as theory of mind. And so what they'll do is they'll hide a, a, an acorn or a seed, right? But if one individual knows that it's being watched by another blue jay, it'll pretend to hide the seed in one place, but it actually won't. It'll then go hide it somewhere else. So it has this idea in its mind that if I hide it here, that individual is going to know that information and come later and steal my seed. So they have this idea, not of just what they know, but of what other individuals know based on whether they are being observed or not. They can also do some pretty neat things with um, cooperation and cooperating with individuals that had cooperated nicely, not just with them in the past, but they can watch. Does that individual play nicely with others? If so, I'll cooperate. If not, I'm not going to cooperate. So, so they are quite clever, uh, these, these corvids and, and, um, and, and parrots too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do robin parents push the nest over when it's time for the babies to fledge? No, they don't. And robin nests are a bit unusual in that they tend to have a large amount of mud. I'd say they are mud-based nests, and so they are heavy. You have to pry them off your gutters at the end of the season if you want to do that. They won't reuse those nests to, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, One of the main one of which is probably parasites. Um, bird nests, are, by the end of the breeding season, are pretty nasty with all those nestlings often pooping in there and dropping feathers and things like this. Um, so, so they will not tip the birds over. But if you think about uh, you know, the, the nestling birds, you have say five, five little nestlings all into this tiny little thing and they're starting to grow. So they're starting to push each other out. But those nestlings are large, they are noisy, they are a delicious snack for a crow, a raven, a cooper's hawk. Um, I was studying Northern goshawks. It's, um, looks, it, it's more, looks like a beauty, kind of like a red-tailed hawk, but it's more closely related to things like sharp shinned and cooper's hawks. And I was watching them on a nest once and the parent came back with a blue jay nestling. Hour later, came back with another blue jay nestling. Hour later, came back with another. So it found, in this case, a blue jay nest and it just proceeded to rob that nest every time it's nestling, it, it's the goshawk nestlings were hungry. So it's a very precarious stage for these nestlings. And so what has happened for most of these species that we think about songbird, uh, such as these, these bund, all these here are songbirds, is they grow out a really crappy set of what are called juvenile feathers. They are the, the cheapest, flimsiest things you can imagine just to get out of the nest so they can scurry along and fly, they don't have to be great flyers to be in a more safe place than stuck in a nest completely unable to fly with four other siblings chirping like crazy and parents continuing to deliver food all day long. So when you see nestlings on the ground that can't fly, it's helpless, I need to save it. They are, unless you see a broken wing and if it's able to stand and walk around, the best thing you can do is just leave it be and um, trust that its parents are watching, which they, unless they've been killed, they will be there close. You might not see the parents, but they see you. And, and these birds rely on large numbers of fledglings to get out and being able to scurry through the brush and on, on just avoiding predators to survive. So, so they get out pretty early. The parents though don't do anything like tipping the nest over. They, they get out on their own pretty quick. Right. 
Um, here is a question about Ducks Unlimited. Is it an ally to bird preservation? Um, in my mind, so I am a huge, I am not a hunter myself. I'll preface it with that. And in my mind, they are, they're, they are doing some of the best conservation work, I think, in the, in the United States and even into Canada and Mexico. I put Nature Conservancy on that list as well. Um, and, and what I'd say is, uh, you know, it, I'm not a proponent of hunting. I don't do it myself. But what DU does is they take membership money, they get donations, and they buy and manage habitat, ultimately often then transferring ownership and management over to uh, say a state agency. To me, that, that habitat loss is the number one threat to birds. I'm not a hunter myself. I value birds and other wildlife for their intrinsic value. Not everybody does that. And so if these other people don't think that birds and frogs and snakes and fish have intrinsic value, but if they think that it has value for hunting or cultural value of some sort, mental health value has been one of the, you know, so-called ecosystem benefits of birds. If that allows us then to go ahead and protect more land, manage land, buying clean watersheds, I, I, I think they're doing really good work, would, would be my, would, is my impression. I, I don't agree with everything. I, I, I don't disagree with hunting. I'm not a hunter myself, but to me, they are, they are, strong and capable allies in the conservation fight. Yes. Great, okay, what is the best bird book for this area? Oh boy, you're, those are fighting words. <laughs> um, so I, I like Sibley's Guide to Birds of the East. I, I've used Sibley a long time. I really like Sibley. National Geographic does a very good book as well. It's hard. The main books that are out there, and you can go and get a, a book for you know less than twenty bucks off of Amazon or a, a, a bookstore if you prefer. Um, but but I I personally like Sibley's Guide to Birds of the East. Now, if you're somebody that goes out to the West a lot, you don't want a bird to the East and a bird to the West, then maybe getting something like National Geographic um, that includes the entire United States might might be better. Um, my recommendation is to get one that doesn't use photos, but instead uses illustrations so that the artist can go ahead and say, I really want to highlight this particular field mark. So for example, in, in uh, this uh, blue gross beak right here to go ahead and say, I really want to illustrate what this looks like in an adult male, in a sub-adult male. How does this look in a female? And, and photos just are, are trickier. And so, so I, I like the, uh, the Sibley Guide to the East and I prefer any field guide that has drawings than photos. Okay. What is the best way to learn to recognize bird sounds or bird songs? Yeah. So for me, uh, I think two things. One is practice. I hate to say it, but it's practice. So every spring I have to go out there and start listening to the bird songs again to kind of you know get the cobwebs off. And, and, and then I'm a visual learner. I, I have to see things visually. So when I am listening to a, the, the, the song or the vocalization, I will also literally look at an image of that bird. So I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, I'm hearing these double note things of the indigo bunting. They do their, their songs often in kind of doublets. And I'm looking at the bird to kind of get that in my head. Now, somebody that's more musically inclined probably is like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But that, that practice and to me getting that visual pairing is what I have to do. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm trying to get to this question. Okay, I've seen blue jays swallow two to three acorns at a time. Do they have cheeks like chipmunks to store these acorns? Uh, they, they don't have cheeks, but they have a crop, right? And so they can store food in the crop. And then as it moves from the crop, it can go down then, so they don't have a typical stomach the way we do that's evolved differently, structured differently, if you will. So they have a crop that's largely for storage. And then that food can then be moved down into the gizzard, which depending on the species of bird, the gizzard of something like one of these buntings here will have little grains of sand in it. Um, something like a uh, uh, blue jay might have tiny, small little, you know, pebble, small little things like this. And then something that's much larger might have, you know, something like an ostrich might have things larger the size, like a, of a cobble, you know, like a good size marble, bigger than a mar like a rock like this. And that gizzard is a muscular organ that then crushes those 
rock grains or cobbles against the food and crushes it. Uh, so, you know, we use our teeth to break down food. Teeth are too heavy for birds to carry around in flight. So they have a different way of, of breaking physically down uh, that food, but they don't store it in their, in their cheeks like uh, some mammals would, but instead store it in a, in a crop. Okay. So the rest of these, uh, our comments, and I think I've uh, been prompted by Mark to try to start wrapping up. So uh, please, everyone who has more questions for Dr. Collins, uh, his email address is right there on the slide. And um, I think you will probably respond yourself. Is that okay, Dr. Collins? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine by me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share my love of birds with you guys. And, and I'd like to give a shout out to everything that Wolf River Conservancy does. I'm a big believer in uh, managing habitat and, and, and education. And I know Kathy's been doing wonderful things there for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, to have the opportunity to, to talk with you guys tonight and share a little bit of my knowledge with birds with you guys. Um, and I hope to see you guys out paddling on the wolf one of these days. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. It was a wonderful program. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. It certainly was, and it sounded like we could probably go on for another 30 minutes or an hour, but uh, I, I do appreciate you so much, uh, Dr. Collins, for being with us this evening. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kathy, for your support on the back end. Most of all, thanks to all of you for attending tonight's presentation. Uh, remember, our next lecture in the series is on the June is on June 16th, and remember to sign up for our Discover the Greenway event before May 22nd. Be well, good night, and thanks to all of you for your support.